is Azora High? Was he good or evil? What role will he play in the current story? Will he be reborn? And if so, who will be the reborn hero? What will his flaming sword look like? Believe it or not, we have answers to every single one of these questions. Except, fans widely dislike the answers given by the text, so they are considered pending issues, and alternative candidates are spoon-fed to us. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Also, you can listen to this on Spotify if you prefer. Check the link in the description. A small disclaimer before we start. That Dragon is Lightbringer and some other aspects of the theory I'm about to present are not my wholly original ideas. I cannot credit every single person who led me to this conclusion or was the originator of the building blocks of that theory because it's a conclusion I've been reaching for years and I simply don't remember who and when made a specific point. In case you do know who originated those, please inform me in the comments. I will gather all of those and put them in the pinned comment. In this video I merely present some of their evidence while adding my very own observations, all this in order to establish as convincing a case as I possibly could. Without further ado, let's proceed. The first mention of Azor Ahai happens in A Clash of Kings wherein Melisandre of Ashai proclaims Stannis Baratheon as Azor Ahai come again. In ancient books of Ashai, it is written that there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword, and that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes, and he who clasps it shall be Azor Ahai come again, and the darkness shall flee before him. She lifted her voice, so it carried out over the gathered host. Azor Ahai, beloved of Rolor, the warrior of light, the son of fire, come forth, your sword awaits you, come forth and take it into your hand. Who exactly was Azor Ahai is explained by Salador San. Do you know the tale of the forging of Lightbringer? I shall tell it to you. It was a time when darkness lay heavy on the world. To oppose it, the hero must have a hero's blade, oh, like none that had ever been. And so, for thirty days and thirty nights, Azor Ahai labored sleepless in the temple, forging a blade in the sacred fires. Hit and hammer and fold, hit and hammer and fold, oh yes, until the sword was done. Yet when he plunged it into the water to temper the steel, it burst asunder. Being a hero, it was not for him to shrug and go in search of excellent grapes, such as these. So again he began. The second time it took him fifty days and fifty nights, and this sword seemed even finer than the first. Azor Ahai captured a lion, to temper the blade by plunging it through the beast's red heart, but once more the steel shattered and split. Great was his woe, and great was his sorrow then, for he knew what he must do. A hundred days and a hundred nights. He labored on the third blade, and as it glowed white hot in the sacred fires, he summoned his wife. Nisa Nisa, he said to her, for that was her name. Bear your breast and know that I love you best of all that is in this world. She did this thing. Why, I cannot say. And Azora Hai thrust the smoking sword through her living heart. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon. But her blood and her soul and her strength and her courage all went into the steel. Such is the tale of the forging of Lightbringer, the Red Sword of Heroes. It is thus speculated that, in light of the threat coming from the north, Azorahai is supposed to be reborn and lead the fight against the others. The figure of Azorahai has different names across the cultures. How long the darkness endured, no man can say, but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hercon the Hero, Azorahai, Yintar, Neferion, and Eldric Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of man and lead the virtuous into battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer, 
that the darkness was put to rout, and light and love returned once to the world. There is a fairly convincing theory that even those Raki have their own version of the Azora High prophecy, the stallion who mounts the world. I have seen his face and heard the thunder of his hoofs, she proclaimed in a thin, wavery voice. The thunder of his hoofs, the others chorused. As swift as the wind, he rides, and behind him his kalasar covers the earth, men without number, with arrows shining in their hands like blades of rays or grass. Fierce as a storm this prince will be. His enemies will tremble before him, and their wives will weep tears of blood and rend their flesh in grief. The bells in his hair will sing his coming, and the milkmen in the stone tents will fear his name. The old woman trembled and looked at Danny, almost as if she were afraid. The prince is riding, and he shall be the stallion who mounts the world. A similar figure exists in the Westerosi legend of the last hero. Now these were the days before the Andals came, and long before the women fled across the narrow sea, from the cities of the Rhoyne. And the hundred kingdoms of those times were the kingdoms of the first men, who had taken these lands from the children of the forest. Yet here and there in the fastness of the woods, the children still lived in their wooden cities and hollow hills, and the faces in the trees kept watch. So as cold and death filled the earth, the last hero determined to seek out the children, in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the dead lands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched, until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog, and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it. And the others smelled the hot blood in him, and came silent on his trail, stalking him with packs of pale white spiders, big as hounds. House of the Dragon, an adaptation of Fire and Blood, also reveals that the reason why Egon the Conqueror decided to unify Westeros was because he saw the threat from beyond the wall in a dream, similar to how Daenys the Dreamer foresaw the doom of Valeria. House of the Dragon co-creator Rael Condal explained how this scene was based on new information Martin gave him during the early writing process. Martin said Egon was a dreamer, a name for Targaryens who had prophetic dreams. That was the detail that George actually gave us early in the story break. The idea that Egon the Conqueror was himself a dreamer, and that's what motivated the conquest. The infamous dagger contains that very prophecy, saying, From my blood comes the prince that was promised, and his will be the song of ice and fire. So if Egon is to be believed, from his line comes the prophesied hero. Curiously, Melisandre, our main source of the information regarding that mysterious figure, uses Azora High and the prince that was promised interchangeably. Westeros must unite beneath her one true king, the prince that was promised, lord of Dragonstone and chosen of Rolor. Before the events of this story, numerous possible candidates for the prince have already been put forward. For instance, Rhaegar and then his son Aegon. Rhaegar, I thought, the smoke was from the fire that devoured Summerhall on the day of his birth. The salt from the tears shed for those who died. He shared my belief when he was young. But later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. In one of the visions in the House of the Undying, the prophecy itself is recounted to Daenerys via Rhaegar. Aegon, he said to a woman nursing a newborn babe in a great wooden bed. What better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. So, it is very likely that Azor Ahai is just one name, and all of those refer to the same person. Additionally, in A Dance with Dragons, we learn that, according to Melisandre, Azor Ahai will wake dragons from stone. When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amid smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. As it is most often the case, Stannis is the very first Azor Ahai reborn candidate, which means that he is likely not the one we are looking for. Stannis does some show of plunging his sword into the burning statue of the Maiden, one of the seven, and his sword does begin to glow like Lightbringer. But how big of a red herring he is becomes relevant a book later, when we learn one crucial thing about his special magical sword. Maester Aemon smiled. 
Your Grace, he said, before we go, I wonder if you would do us the great honor of showing us this wondrous blade we have all heard so very much of. You want to see Lightbringer, a blind man? Some shall be my eyes. Steel scrapped against wood and leather, and radiance filled the solar, shimmering, shifting, a dance of gold and orange and red light, all the bright colors of fire. Tell me, Samuel. Maester Amon touched his arm. It glows, said Sam in a harsh voice, as if it were on fire. There are no flames, but the steel is yellow and red and orange, all flashing and glimmering, like sunshine on water, but prettier. I wish you could see it, Maester. I see it now, Sam, a sword full of sunlight, so lovely to behold. The old man bowed stiffly. Your grace, my lady, this was most kind of you. When King Stannis sheathed the shining sword, the room seemed to grow very dark, despite the sunlight streaming through the window. Maester Aemon was lost in thought, as Sam helped him down the narrow, turnpike stair. But as they were crossing the yard, he said, I felt no heat. Did you, Sam? Heat from the sword, he thought back. The air around it was shimmering, the way it does above a hot brazier. Yet you felt no heat, did you? And the scabbard that held this sword, it is wooden leather, yes? I heard the sound when his grace drew out the blade. Was the leather scorched, Sam? Did the wood seem burnt or blackened? No, Sam admitted. Not that I could see. This is a dead giveaway that Stannis' sword is not the real Lightbringer. The reason for this state of things is because Stannis had not made a personal sacrifice. Azor Ahai's sacrifice of his wife was personal to him. Hence the heat and love of his wife went to the sword and generated the very thing necessary for true fire. Heat. Stannis is just playing a mummer's force, putting on a performance without the core of what makes Azor Ahai Azor Ahai. So... Who else could be Azor Ahai? We learn of Azor Ahai and his legion in book 2. Yet in book 1, we already have someone who woke dragons from stone, who was born amid salt and reborn amid smoke, and, arguably, forged a magical sword using their significant other. That someone is Daenerys Targaryen. The nurse was receiving hints about her true destiny all throughout A Game of Thrones, right until the moment of the birth of dragons. I have made a video where I speculate on this issue, what were the mechanics of it all, as well as what led to it. However, I have since changed my mind on some aspects of that theory when I was met with other people's additional insights. I will recap it here briefly and add some of the new building blocks to it all to make a fuller picture of the situation. In A Game of Thrones, Daenerys has a total of three dragon dreams. The most important of these three dragon dreams is the last one, in which she is chasing the house with the red door, while being urged by mysterious people with swords made out of pale fire to run away from a cold breath that would have her die something worse than death. Dany only truly manages to escape when wings grow out of her back and she flies. Then, as she wakes up, she feels her dragon eggs emit heat. Dani then constructs the pyre. Everything she does is deliberate, down to the placement of the eggs. Dani is working on intuition here. Per George, the whole point of the scene in A Game of Thrones where Daenerys hatches the dragons is that she makes the magic up as she goes along. She is someone who really might do anything. I wanted magic to be something barely under control and half instinctive. The placement of eggs is especially important. She climbed the pyre herself to place the eggs around her sun and stars. The black beside his heart, under his arm. The green beside his head, his braid cold around it. The cream and gold down between his legs. Do you notice where the first egg, the one that would later be dragon, is placed? Next to his heart. Just like Lightbringer was forged by Azor Ahai, plunging his sword into Nessa Nessa's heart. It is also the egg that hatches last. Like Azor Ahai tried to forge Lightbringer three times and succeeded only the third time, here it happens all the same. Rhaegal and Viserion are the first two failed attempts to forge the sword, but it works on the third attempt. As such, Drogon, the youngest, is Lightbringer. Daenerys fulfills the rest of the prophecy in full in the first out of five currently released books. Born amidst salt and smoke, Dragonstone is the place of salt and smoke, as pointed out by Mr. Most traditional fantasy hero himself. Of all the currently living characters that could be Azor Ahai, Daenerys is the only one undoubtedly born on Dragonstone. John was born in the Tower of Joy in Dorne, whereas Stannis was born in Storm's End. 
One could also argue that Dani was metaphorically reborn amidst smoke in the funeral pyre. She is also reborn under the bleeding star, the comet, when she survives the pyre, as Khaleesi, as mother of dragons, as Daenerys the queen. The bleeding star appears specifically as Dani is about to step into the pyre, and she considers it to be the best sign to proceed. And in A Clash of Kings, she is also visited by three wise people who follow the star to reach her. Daenerys forges Lightbringer using the personal sacrifice of Drogo, much like Azor Ahai tempered his sword in the heart of his beloved wife, Nessa Nessa. Daenerys literally woke dragons from stone and thus far remains the only person to do so, and will remain the only person to do so, because she is Azor Ahai. Hallowed Harpy on TikTok has made a further connection between dragons and swords by linking it to Excalibur. Let's talk about the reasons why absolutely no one will ever convince me that Lightbringer was ever meant to be a literal sword, rather than Drogon, Danny's dragon, brought forth specifically from her self-sacrifice in a mirror of the self-sacrifice of Nisa Nisa that forged the original Lightbringer, who was also a dragon. The low-hanging fruit as to why I think this is what the fuck is a single flaming sword and a single human man going to do against countless undead, countless others, versus a fucking dragon. Why then does Danny dragon dream, bathing her ice enemies in fire, dragon fire, and watching them melt away? But there are less obvious reasons for my firmly held belief in this. We are given two versions of the Azor Ahai Returned Prophecy. One of them talks about, and they're very similar, but the primary difference between the two is that one of them talks about how he will pull Lightbringer from the flames, and the second version talks about how he will wake dragons from stone. The first version that talks about Lightbringer does not mention dragons, and the second version that talks about dragons does not mention Lightbringer. Because they're the same. It's the same prophecy. They're talking about the same thing. But it's deeper than that, because George loves to reference other literary works, other mythology. I mean, just all kinds. The references in his work are off the charts. And I very much believe that waking dragons from stone is a play off of pulling Excalibur from the stone. Because that's what Danny does. She wakes dragons from stone and she pulls forth, brings forth dragons, Drogon, from the fire. She seamlessly completes both versions of the prophecy because Lightbringer and Drogon are the same. So when Danny, the chosen one of the Song of Ice and Fire, wakes dragons from stone, that is the equivalent of King Arthur pulling Excalibur from the stone. But it's cooler because it's a girl and it's dragons. So yeah, read them and weep, Snowboys. Lightbringer is a dragon. Lightbringer is Drogon. I, and I'm sorry for your loss. Let us for a moment return to Vyas the Track. When Dani receives the prophecy that her son is going to be the stallion who mounts the world, the woman making the prophecy looks at Dani with something akin to fear. Later, in A Clash of Kings, Dani has the following vision. Beneath the Mother of Mountains, a line of naked crones crept from a great lake and knelt shivering before her, their grey heads bowed. Dani is currently en route to Vyas the Track, where she is likely going to be proclaimed the stallion who mounts the world and unites all the Kalasars into one. It was never her son, but Dani herself. The way I imagine this happening is by Dani entering the Mother of Mountains, the place that only men are permitted to go, ironically, and finding Drogon there. When the Thraki see Dani riding a dragon, they will probably lose their shit, since this is the mightiest mount they could imagine. The stallion is also significant because, according to the prophecy, the Dothraki will ride to the ends of Earth, irrespective of the fact that they are on the continent of Essos and they are known to mistrust the sea and never sail. In Brown's coma dream, he sees the following. Finally, he looked north. He saw the wall shining like blue crystal and his bastard brother John sleeping alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. And he looked past the wall, past endless forests clogged in snow, past the frozen shore and the great blue-white rivers of ice and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north and north he looked, to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know, the crow whispered, as it sat on his shoulder. Now you know what you must live. Why, Bran said, not understanding. Falling, falling. Because winter is coming. 
So the Dothraki will not only cross the sea, but will likely ride north with Dany, where Drogon, Lightbringer, will destroy the Heart of Winter, something that gives others their power, from which they originate or both. All of this is neatly connected with the lore of the story and its events. The evidence that Daenerys is the one, one who already fulfilled the prophecy, and it will lead somewhere, is overwhelming. Nonetheless, that possibility is ignored, dismissed, and overall met with a lot of resistance. Generally, there exist four most commonly used excuses to shut down these facts. Because let's call it what it is. These are facts. One, prophecy is tricky. Two, Azor Ahai was actually evil, so whoever is reborn as Azor Ahai will also be evil. Three, prophecy is not supposed to be literal. Four, it's all a red herring. Let's scrutinize all of them. Indeed, prophecy is tricky, and we do see instances of people being deceived by it. Crucially, it does not happen in the case of Daenerys. Why? Because prophecy becomes tricky when someone wants to either will it into existence or avert it. We have examples of both. Cersei desperately tries to avoid the Valonqar prophecy she heard from Maggie the Frog. You will wed the king. Queen you shall be until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all that you hold dear. The king and you will have children, six and ten for him and three for you. Gold shall be their crowns and gold their shrouds. And when your tears have drowned you, the Valonqar shall wrap his hands about your pale white throat and choke the life from you. Via Cersei, we see how the psychological mechanism of a self-fulfilling prophecy works. Her attempts at avoiding it all backfire at her. First, she assumes the Valonqar, which translates to little sibling, to be Tyrion, and antagonizes him in part due to their mother's death, in part because she immediately suspects him of being the Valonqar. This is wrong for two reasons. One, if you hate someone, they will hate you back, and will be more likely to kill you. Two, she forgets that she has another younger brother. Cersei does have three children with her brother Jaime, while Robert has 16, because he's a bastard. Who is the younger and more beautiful queen is up to interpretation as of now. Cersei assumes it to be Marjorie, and whether she is a red herring or the actual younger, more beautiful queen is up to debate. It could work thematically for Marjorie to be the younger queen, since it would fit the pattern of Cersei making it all that more difficult for herself by accidentally fulfilling some aspects of the prophecy, like having three children and not a single one by Robert, for instance. Which I fully understand, I wouldn't want to have Robert's kids as well, but you get what I mean. Other candidates are of course possible, it's very much a pending issue. Now, let's look at another instance of prophecies being tricky. Melisandra tries to make Stannis into Azor Ahai, suffering from a bad case of confirmation bias. She had convinced herself that Stannis is her Azor Ahai and interprets everything in his favor, even if it contradicts the words of the prophecy. He is not dead. Stannis is the Lord's Chosen, destined to lead the fight against the Dark. I have seen it in the flames, read of it in ancient prophecy. Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt. John had heard all this before. Stannis Baratheon was the Lord of Dragonstone, but he was not born there. He was born at Storm's End, like his brothers. And now... Snow Cell's favorite quote. The flames cracked softly, and in their crackling, she heard the whispered name Jon Snow. His long face floated before her, length in tangents of red and orange, appearing and disappearing again, a shadow half seen behind a fluttering curtain. Now he was a man, now a wolf, now a man again. But the skulls were here as well, the skulls were all around him. Melisandre had seen his danger before, had tried to warn the boy of it. Enemies all around him, daggers in the dark. He would not listen. Yet now she could not even seem to find her king. I pray for a glimpse of Azor Ahai, and Rolor shows me only snow. Which is also conveniently taken out of context. Melisandra sees this vision in the context of John's future death in a mutiny, his consciousness residing in ghosts for a while, then returning back to his body, as his resurrection is complete. This is not John Azor Ahai foreshadowing. This is the flames trying to direct Melisandra into the more pressing issue, which is the whole mutiny about to take place. But I digress. We will talk about Mr. Traditional Fantasy later. So as you can see, Melisandra had predecided that Stannis is Azor Ahai and tries to guide him to fulfill that destiny. It does not work because of her own confirmation bias. This is what makes the prophecy tricky. If you set your mind towards a certain conclusion for the prophecy or a certain person fulfilling it, then you will always find reasons to continue to believe it, even if you have evidence to the contrary. 
It's the case of the same confirmation bias we see in real life as well. For example, when you're certain that Danny is a mad queen that will torch King's Landing, your brain will automatically interpret everything she does as wrong and ignore all the foreshadowing around Cersei and John Con. I find it peculiar how invocations of the trickery of prophecy are only invoked in the case of Daenerys when she is the character least likely to be swayed by it, because she literally has no idea about any prophecy. Sure, she receives other prophecies, but the one about Azor Ahai? She has no idea about it. Her fulfillment of that prophecy was placed, chronologically, before the actual prophecy was shown to us. I also suspect that this prophecy by itself was written around Daenerys' deed in A Game of Thrones. While Dani may sense that something grander is going on, she does not follow the Red God, nor does she know about Azor Ahai or all those other legends. Yet the prophecy was already fulfilled by her in full. Thus, she cannot fall victim to this stubborn confirmation bias or try to avert it, because the deed is already done. There literally is no textual evidence towards Danny being obsessed with prophecy. So why is this prophecy tricky used specifically in her case? Well, because it's an excuse. A smokescreen to hide just how much evidence there is to her being the one. Let's look at another excuse. Azor Ahai was in fact evil. I'm gonna make a bold assumption that the Azor Ahai is actually evil was also born precisely out of the sheer scale of the evidence pointing towards Daenerys being Azor Ahai, coupled with the Mad Queen obsession. So Azor Ahai is considered to be evil by some people due to the fact that he killed his wife to forge a magical sword. I personally don't see it like this. In my eyes, Nissa Nessa was very much willing to sacrifice herself. She must have known that the previous two attempts at forging Lightbringer failed, and when her husband asked her to bear her breast, as he was holding a sword, she must not only have the trust in her beloved, but also know what he was doing and agree to it. Notice how, all of a sudden, when it's time to talk about how John is totally the sole hero of the story, quadruple-wielding Blackfire, Dark Sister, Dawn and also Longclaw, Azor Ahai is not evil when he kills his girlfriend to forge magical swords. The invocation of evilness is there solely in the case of Daenerys, because of the very resistance to the idea that yes, it is her. But also notice the differences between Azor Ahai forging Lightbringer versus how it goes in the case of Daenerys. Drogo is already dead when the sacrifice is being performed, and Dany very much did not want him to die. She did everything in her power to save him. She herself was willing to die for him, and euthanized him when she knew that he won't ever be the same. Another point that Hallowed Harpy made me realize is that the sacrifice, the birth of dragons, worked only because Dani herself was willing to walk into the flames. Daenerys is her own Nissa Nissa. This is the aspect of the theory that I have since updated from my initial How to Wake Dragons from Stone. The prophecy cannot be taken literally is another one of the excuses. Funnily enough, the people who cry about that non-literal prophecy believe that the actual fulfillment of the prophecy will come from John killing Daenerys and forging a literal sword. But Dany fulfilled the prophecy non-literally, precisely because she did not have any guidelines or instruction manuals. Daenerys was not forging actual swords either, but hatching dragons. The prophecy by itself was not literal also because 1. Drogo was already dead by the time he lied on the pyre, 2. The gender of the people involved was switched. It's Daenerys who's Azor Ahai and Drogo who is Nessa Nessa. The prophecy was not fulfilled literally in Dany's case, so why is this even an argument? And the biggest cope of it all, it's a red herring. Now, I could just call it cope and move on, because that's what it is. Apparently, all of this was a deflection. The true fulfillment of the prophecy will come from some guy literally plunging a sword into his girlfriend's body. That a single sword will not do shit against hordes of others notwithstanding. And this red herring worked on absolutely no one, because mentioning the mere possibility that Daenerys is Azor Ahai results with people swarming your mansions and talking about how it just has to be the most conventional of our heroes, because being a woman and being disabled makes you inherently predisposed to be the villain of the story by the very end, right? Contrary to a popular belief, George is not all about tricking you or subverting your expectations. Every big plot development of his is extremely well established, foreshadowed and set up before it happens. Take for instance the foreshadowing around the Red Wedding, or even the entirety of Daenerys' A Game of Thrones arc, which is one big setup for the return of dragons. 
So if anything, the sheer scale of evidence towards Daenerys being Azora High with Drogon as Lightbringer makes it as good as canon because the build up towards it is just too grand for it to lead somewhere else. Book 1 out of 5, Daenerys already fulfilled all the requirements, non-literally, without being tricked by it. And we only find out she did so retroactively. <laughs> A while ago, I went to my local library, and since International Women's Day was approaching, the library had a dedicated shelf for books related to women, perspectives on womanhood, women's problems, feminist literature, and so on. One of the books that struck me was the one that I wished to read for a long time, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men, written by Caroline Criado Perez. Perez talks about how the subconscious bias in data causes people to build a world that is by default catered towards men. Taking after de Beauvoir and her now iconic work, The Second Sex, Perez positions a thesis that, by assuming male to be the default, women are constantly met with systemic barriers that make their lives difficult or often plain impossible. For instance, the symptoms of heart attacks are different in men and women, but it's men's symptoms that are considered the standard in diagnosis. This makes women more likely to dismiss the issue, or make the doctors dismiss the issue as well. As such, women are more likely to die of a heart attack, in spite of the ratio of heart attacks being equal. And this is just one example. Women's invisibility literally kills and maims them. I recommend that you guys just read the book yourselves, but I want to bring up one thing that Perez mentioned in the foreword to the book. One that I think best illustrates the point of this entire video. Even human bones are not exempt from male unless otherwise indicated thinking. We may think of human skeletons as being objectively either male or female, and therefore exempt from male default thinking. We would be wrong. For over a hundred years, a 10th century viking skeleton, known as the Birka warrior, had, despite possessing an apparently female pelvis, been assumed to be male because it was buried alongside a full set of weapons and two sacrificed horses. These grave contents indicated that the occupant had been a warrior, and warrior meant male. Archaeologists put the numerous references to female fighters in Viking lore down to mythical embellishments. But although weapons apparently trump the pelvis when it comes to sex, they don't trump DNA, and in 2017, testing confirmed that these bones did indeed belong to a woman. The argument didn't, however, end there. It just shifted. The bones might have been mixed up, there might be other reasons a female body was buried with these items. Naysaying scholars may have a point on both counts, although based on the layout of the grave contents, the original authors dismiss this criticism. But the resistance is nevertheless revealing, particularly since male skeletons in similar circumstances are not questioned in the same way. Indeed, when archaeologists deep up grave sites, they nearly always find more males, which, as noted anthropologist Philip Walker, dryly noted in a 1995 book chapter on sex in schools, is not consistent with what we know about the sex ratios of extant human populations. And given Viking women could own property, could inherit, and could become powerful merchants, is it so impossible that they could have fought too? After all, these are far from the only female warrior bones that have been discovered. Battle-scarred skeletons of multiple women have been found across the Eurasian steppes from Bulgaria to Mongolia, wrote Natalie Highness in The Guardian. For people such as the ancient Scythians, who fought on horseback with bows and arrows, there was no innate male warrior advantage, and DNA testing of skeletons buried with weapons of more than 1,000 Scythian burial mounds from Ukraine to Central Asia have revealed that up to 37 of Scythian women and girls were active warriors. I think channel veterans know what I'm getting at with this passage. Look at the resistance in the archaeological and anthropological circles to the mere possibility that the bones of the Birka warrior might have belonged to a woman. She certainly had anatomy one would assume to be female, and knowing what we know of Vikings, it should not be so mind-blowing to consider the possibility that the Birka warrior was a woman. They would sooner believe that someone switched the bones like a Looney Tunes villain than to consider that possibility. And if this isn't emblematic of this whole Azora High issue, it has to be a red herring. It's too obvious. She's too conventional. 
There's too many signs. Prophecy tricky. Every excuse under the sun is used to conceal that mere possibility that Azor Ahai is not who you assumed him to be. When you saw all the talks of the prophesized hero and figured that Regar and Lyanna are John's parents, your mind immediately went to the conclusion you would see in other fantasy stories, that John is the hero. Of course, your eyes immediately went to the sacred prince with magical parents, and it blinded you so much that you did not see a girl who was supposed to be nothing but a collateral in the stories of others, fulfilling the prophecy before you even knew about it. And it does not start with Azor Ahai either. Dan is very important, her magic and her storyline are downplayed by the fandom at large. Not only many people miss the fact that Daenerys was sold into bridal slavery, an equal number of them do not realize that her Game of Thrones storyline is a long, consistent string that culminates in Daenerys 10 A Game of Thrones. To this day, people are convinced that Danny either looked out of that pyre, wanted to commit suicide and magically survived, or Miri Mazdor accidentally casted a fireproof spell on her. You need to be a capital E extremist to notice that everything was deliberate, she knew what she was doing, she sensed the truth of it, and it was not just a happy coincidence. Heck, I saw people claim that Daenerys is not even a dragon dreamer and does not really have special powers. That already shows a certain amount of willful ignorance with how her storyline is approached and reinforces her invisibility. If it is all assumed to not be that important in the grand scheme of things because her destiny is to be a mad queen dead on a man's magical sword, it has to be rendered irrelevant and precisely just a happy coincidence so that what she accumulated herself falls into the hands of someone more deserving, an able-bodied man. The original myth of Azor Ahai positions the two halves, male and female, in the traditional sense. Azor Ahai sacrifices his willing wife, then takes a step over her corpse and, flaming sword in hand, becomes the hero. In all of this, she is forgotten by everyone, even by him. If he does remember her, then not as a person, but how the need to kill her affects him, his story, his psyche and his emotions. The perspective is firmly his, he brims with life as her body lies lifeless, a piece of meat to lead him towards that grand destiny. It is men who are warriors and women who are their sacrifices, their bodies used to temper their magical swords, their bodies paving the way for man's glory. It has to happen like that should Azor Ahai come again, right? Daenerys has to be Nissa Nissa with her literal magical sword plunged into her heart by some guy. Who cares that only Daenerys fulfilled the entire prophecy before we even know of it? Who cares that it's Danny who was born and reborn amidst salt and smoke? Who cares that Danny literally physically woke dragons from stone, performed the sacrifice, had dreams that led her to this destiny? Who cares that she is described as a gendered subversion? Why is Danny a princess and not a prince? I made this choice a long time ago, but I think I wanted to play a little with gender roles and reverse things a little. And of course, Mother of Dragons, to my mind, is much better than Father of Dragons. There is the connection between the woman who brings forth life, carrying a huge power of death, fire and destruction. There are very powerful metaphors in there. And who cares that the author himself pointed his finger at you in 2005? What fools we were who thought ourselves so wise. The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female. Barf saw the truth of that. But now one and now the other, as changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. Daenerys is the one, born amidst salt and smoke. The dragons prove it. The error crept in from the translation. Valyrian is a gender-neutral language. Valyrian Darilaros may refer to both a prince and a princess, just like sibling in English can refer to a sister or a brother. But we do subconsciously assume it has to be a man, a prince, because of what is considered traditionally masculine. It has always been men. It has always been princes that wield magical swords. It is men who are warriors. Their women exist to cheer on them or bear their breasts, only to be forgotten when their disposable bodies are no longer necessary. It's all a red herring. It's too obvious. The bones got mixed up. Women can be warriors. Women can be heroes. Women can be messianic figures. The gendered subversion rings as true as it did in the 90s, in spite of the progress and changes in literature itself. Fans are mentally stuck in traditional fantasy, where women are permitted only three roles. Evil queens, gentle mothers and disposable girlfriends. This is supposed to be that grand subversion. 
It becomes all that more sinister when you realize that, for Daenerys to not be a hero after all, all of the personal sacrifices she made and all her accomplishments are made irrelevant. She will, after all, give her dragons to someone else, or someone will just take them from her without breaking a sweat. For Jon or whoever else to be the hero, it is a necessary step, because even the most delusional Jon stands know that he won't wake any new dragons from stone. Daenerys, her sacrifice, her choices, her journey, supposedly existed only so that she can be delivered to Jon Snow as a piece of meat to sacrifice, her potential death made about him, because he is going to be so sad when he has to sacrifice her to be the hero, or kill her when she becomes a rabid dog. Wow, so subversive, never happened before. But Daenerys' invisibility goes even further. For the sake of making the most conventional fantasy hero the sole hero of the story, her importance is diminished in more and more ways, chiefly by erasing the fact that not only is she the hero, not only is she a main character, but a titular one as well. Well, of course, the two outlying ones, the things that are going north of the wall and uh, Daenerys Targaryen on the other continent with her dragons are, are of course, the ice and fire of the, of the title, A Song of Ice and Fire. This is a quote that is either ignored, obfuscated, or lied about. It is ignored when, instead, it is claimed that A Song of Ice and Fire is John because fire hit ice raw and Magical Prince was born from the union of two special magical bloodlines. Crucially, nothing about Azora High Prophecy talks about special bloodlines or the prince needing to be half fire, half ice. Nobody says anything about how Azora High or previous Azora High-like figures needed special parentage. And besides, by the time Rhaegar ran off with Lyanna, he was convinced that his eldest son was the prince that was promised. If light about, it's claimed that George said, Danny is fire and John is ice. I can't count how many times I saw people falsely claim that. But this isn't what George is saying here. He says north of the wall, and John only spends a part of his story behind the wall. Thus, north of the wall refers to the others. Only the nurse is mentioned by name. If it was John, he would say, the Song of Ice and Fire are Danny and her dragons and Jon Snow. But it's Daenerys, only Daenerys. And yet it's made about Jon after all. Because it has to, right? After the entire fandom made Jon, the most traditional, noble male hero into the second coming of Christ, the one who will become the sole hero at the expense of everyone else, while the rest of the key five become rabid dogs, of course he has to, because it's what we've always seen because the traditional masculine and feminine, that Daenerys is a gendered subversion notwithstanding, that the issue is raised in the story itself, how the issue had always been the overlooking of women, the issue had always been who we think is allowed to take the role of the hero. None of that is relevant. John becomes the hero because he had special parents and walked over the corpses of his girlfriend and everyone else, all while ignoring all the things Dany achieved, since by the end her subservient role towards him has to be reinforced and violently, because it's how it's always been. We already know who Azora High is, and we already know what her Lightbringer is. The resistance to this fact of the story lies in Daenerys' gender and presupposed ideas about her role in the story that also stem from preconceived beliefs about the role of women in society and fiction. The willful ignorance as to her importance to the story is there for that very reason. The very magic surrounding her character and her grand destiny is erased either in favor of making her the villain or the disposable woman to a man, so that what she accumulates becomes his. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. And remember that Phoenix rises from the ashes, and ashes always land on top.